Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the show where we explore the new world of data science, machine learning and artificial intelligence. If you think of data as the new oil, you can consider us Car Talk. And with me, as always, on this epic virtual road trip down the information superhighway is Andy Leonard. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you? I'm doing great. What do you think of that new buzzword bingo intro? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. You know, there's a meme going around on social media about online meetings and buzzword bingo. I think it's kind of cool. I think I've said every single thing this week. I'm not very original when it comes to these, you know, online meetings. And I do a lot of those because I work remotely. Most of the time I'm here in Farmville at my desk talking to people via Skype or GoToMeeting or WebEx or one of the others. There's like a hundred of those online meeting solutions now. There are, and I think they're very helpful for, uh, especially for remote workforce. A lot of people are doing that. I, I also have seen some recent bad press about working remotely, and I get it. You know, I've seen it go both ways. My solution is, um, as a, a former hiring manager, actually, I'm still a hiring manager now that I think of it. I just hire adults. Yeah, adults will actually do their own work. It's shocking how how rare though adults are, and it's not a not an indicator of age. It's more of a mentality. Absolutely, yeah. It has nothing to do really with how old someone is. It's it's about work ethic. It's about being responsible. It's about being professional. Well, there you go. That's a great great way to put it. No, I mean I I mean I've uh, I've encountered that here in D.C. where you know uh, some of the jobs are on the other side of the Potomac Ocean. And, uh, you know, that that basically confines me to, you know, a minimum of 90 minutes per day, uh, actually on a good day, 90 minutes on a bad day, you know, four hours a day in the car. And it's just like, no, I'm not going to do that, particularly because I got a really cool rig here at home. You know, I've got a treadmill desk now. A treadmill desk. A treadmill desk. OK, you're going to have to explain that. All right, so I got a standing desk from Ikea, actually. Cause some of these things, some of these standing desks can be quite expensive. Ikea ones are pretty reasonable. They're about $600 range. I liked it, uh, and I liked it so much that I noticed when I was using it, I felt better. I had more energy and all that, all that good stuff. But I also noticed that I would naturally kind of, you know, standing all day was kind of uncomfortable, and I'd find myself kind of rocking back and forth. So I looked online and, you know, that's not an uncommon thing is that once people get a standing desk, they, they want to walk. So there's actually under desk treadmills uh, that you can get. And uh, I got something like that. So, you know, I can track how far I'm walking. I also have a Fitbit. So I have that, you know, it's all about collecting the data, Andy. You know, the health is kind of like a, a secondary thing. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting the first day i got it i walked about a mile and a half wow and uh yesterday i walked uh just over two miles nice and all while i was learning data science and working on some secret projects um that maybe by the time this show airs will not be so secret anymore well, that's awesome then we'll just leave that teaser there our friend uh, Kevin Hazard joins us today. Kevin's from the Richmond, Virginia area. Uh, he's an author, a consultant. He's an enterprise architect. And, and I've known Kevin for probably a decade, maybe more. And he's one of the true enterprise architects that I know. Uh, he's focused on evolving the business and software development into a true engineering discipline. I'm, I'm reading from his LinkedIn profile here, but... I know Kevin, and this is accurate. Uh, he's also a visionary who is not afraid to take risks and lead. He's a servant leader. He's compassionate and caring to his coworkers. He's a teacher, friend, a mentor, very strong competitor in the marketplace of ideas. He's also the recipient of the Lifetime INETA Community Champion Excellence Award. Hey, welcome to Data Driven, Kevin. Thank you for being here with us today. Hey, thanks, Andy. Appreciate it. 
Yeah, it's great having you on the show. One of the conversations you and I had was at the first Build Conference. One of the parties, the attendee parties, it was like an outdoor venue. And you were telling me all about this awesome language that you'd just gotten into called Python. You were just gushing about the language, how awesome it was, how, you know, all these things. And I was like, you know, I should, probably should look into Python. Fast forward five years later, <laughs> I actually did get deep into Python. And I concur. It is an awesome language. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's uh, <clears throat> I don't know if this is a family show, but I, I can at least say it's JavaScript that doesn't suck. Right. It does impose a certain amount of order onto the JavaScript-ish type model. It does. Yeah, and it comes batteries included. That's the term we use in the Python space. So if you are looking to do something that has already been done, no matter what you're trying to do, someone's already done it. Finding that and, and getting that module installed is just you know, a matter of minutes. Typically, uh, because of the metadata that Python keeps about uh, different object types, under like prototypes in JavaScript, it's, it's easy to integrate and work with. It is amazing all the places that you see Python you know, pop up, whether it's robotics, whether it's IoT, or data science uh, and machine learning. There's a quite a bit of uh, machine learning libraries that are in Python. No doubt. Yeah, it's it's great language. You know, I don't know how it will fare in the marketplace, uh, given so many other choices today. You know, R and F sharp and you name it. Uh, a lot of people trying to solve the same problems, but uh, Python's a great toolkit. So at least something to have in a tool bag. No, absolutely. And for all our listeners who are R aficionados, it's not that we don't love you. It's just today we're talking about Python. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on the you know R or Python in data science? If you really look at it, Python as a language isn't a data processing language per se. I mean, very few languages that fall into that camp anyway. Uh, R is different in that respect in that it's got an analytical bent to it from day one. It was designed for that purpose. So from that perspective, I mean, there are some, some things you can do with R that are very difficult to do in any other language. Right. Python just happens to be, we happen to be in the right place at the right time and have the right mix of capabilities such that um, as people were trying to assemble the tools to solve problems, they found that they were available and easy to integrate. The same thing, honestly, it could have happened in the JavaScript space. JavaScript could be a great data science language had all of the components been in the right place at the right time with the people who were trying to use it, focusing on making it work for that purpose. I don't really think it's a Python versus R. I think it's um, using the right tool to solve the problem at hand. Absolutely. And I, I advocate being bilingual in terms of Python versus R. No doubt. Anybody in data science should be fluent in both. Absolutely. And in, ter in terms of JavaScript being a data science language, I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, that, that would have been very intriguing. One thing I've learned over the years is not to count JavaScript out of the fight just yet. The thing is, JavaScript is the language that can be all things to all people, sort of like English, in that English is not particularly elegant for describing things, just because our declinations and conjugations and tenses have been really dumbed down in English to support assimilation. Uh, there's a great book called Our Magnificent Bastard Tongue that I, I read probably once or a year just to go back and try to understand um, how English developed as an assimilation language. It reminds me a lot of JavaScript <laughs> uh, in that it's been dumbed down to the point where it can be used for almost anything, and it's not particularly elegant at any of them. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. <laughs> there was, I want to say it's King Charles V who said that he would, um, he would speak Italian to his wife, German to his horse, and I forget where English fit in, or if English fit in at all. But it, I mean, I mean, even in human languages, there's a there's a purpose to each language and kind of a target market, and somewhere where that language really excels in that no one else can. Sure. Yeah. And if you read that book that I referenced, I mean, that's his argument that the language was was dumbed down over a course of hundreds of years in an effort to uh, assimilate cultures. It's a strong argument. I mean, there's. People that obviously don't agree with that. I like it. It works in my mind anyway. 
Kevin, one of the things you mentioned early on when we started talking was you mentioned metadata. And one of your books is called Metaprogramming and .NET. I have a copy of that sitting right here within arm's reach. I pick it up every now and then and thumb through it. I try to understand the advanced concepts you were talking about in there. And every now and then I learn something. I think it's a fantastic book. Have you written anything else? I do some writing here and there. Nothing at the, you know, sort of a book format since then. It's been a few years. I do have a couple of chapters for a couple of different books that I've started on, just more of projects of my own. I found that uh, writing books is almost like teaching in that in an effort to explain how something works to someone else, you know, to a student, you have to get outside your own box. Think about it from their perspective. How would I convey to someone who doesn't understand this subject how to grok it, right? That's a Robert Heinlein term. So not just understand it, but almost understanding at a religious level, right? A deep level uh, where you have, you know, an intuition about how the thing works. And writing requires, that's an exercise for an author of a book. And I, I do that in my daily job. I write, you know, the TLDR, right? Too long, didn't read uh, messages from time to time to coworkers to help them grok a, a concept that I'm trying to convey. So typically around something architectural, like, you know, we're going to build a system that has uh, event hubs here and uh, we'll use stream analytics here. And the reason that we're doing that is for asynchronicity in this portion of the system, fault tolerance or reliability. You know, when you do that every day in a job situation, whether you're on the whiteboard doing it or writing it in text, um, it just doesn't leave me a lot of time to think about assembling an entire book. But I do have a few chapters started for a couple of different projects, and one of these days I might find the time to get them into book form. I've read your blog out at devjourney.com, and there are some fascinating articles out there. I think one I read maybe a year ago was how things would be different uh, had databases been built to reside in memory rather than be persisted to disk. It's an interesting time that we're living in with Redis Cache, which I use. We use Redis Cache a lot. I didn't first start thinking of it like a NoSQL database, but um, it certainly has name value paired you know, data structure, storage systems go. It's a database. I think that article you're referring to might have talked about University of Pittsburgh, you know, where the ENIAC was developed back in the late 40s. It did. I still believe, fundamentally, that had you been able to sort of go back in time and give those folks what they would think of as unlimited memory, that the modern database would not have developed the way it did um, at all. Because you would have, if you have immediate access to your data and memory, virtually or otherwise, right, uh, it changes the way the semantics for your conversation with the data. We're kind of coming back around to that, you know, where memory is so cheap that we have Redis instances that store terabytes of data in memory for immediate access. Um, and, you know, just a few years ago, that was very difficult to do. And the interfaces to those databases are just so so cheap and easy to, to use, a sort of commodity HTTP-like interfaces to the databases that you don't have to build uh, complex query languages to, to make them work. And if you're clever about the way you store data, so for example, with geo, geo work, if you do, we have a system where we do what's called latitude slicing. Rather than doing geospatial functions to find something, if you store all of the, say, retail stores that are in the same latitude in a hash in Redis, or actually like a, a, a sorted set in, in uh, Redis, then it's a matter of setting up their score object as their longitude. And it's very, very simple to say, find me all the objects within this score, right, this longitude of everything in this latitude slice. If you're doing proximity searches, you don't have to worry about haversine functions and doing distance calculations based on cosines and sines. You can just do latitude slicing and get amazingly fast performance looking at alternative ways of the storage model as a means to get to a very fast query interface, if that makes sense. No, that does make sense. But the question I have is, could you do longitude slicing too? You could. It turns out the United States is wider than it is tall. <laughs> oh, well, that makes sense. 
we tried it both ways, actually. We just ended up getting more store density within a specific geo for the common radiuses that we were searching on so that our score matching just tended to work better with latitude slicing versus longitude slicing. We tested it both ways and just picked that one. Oh, okay. So it, your mileage may vary, vary depending on your geography. Absolutely. For instance, Argentina or Chile would probably have... <laughs> Or it could just be an anomaly of the way cities are laid out in the U.S. I have no idea. It is interesting. We do see some clustering in specific quadrants of areas. Like, you know, the, the southwest quadrant of a city seems to be more populated with retail stores than the other quadrants in most cities. Don't know why that is, but it, it is something we've noticed. Now that you mention it, I can think of a few examples. The first standard deviation on it, not that, not that large, but we do see a pattern. It's... Not that it makes a difference for how we're doing that algorithm, but we have noticed it. We didn't ask the question we usually lead with, which is, what do you do these days? So I was in independent consulting for a while, for several years, and got really hounded by one of my ex-clients to come to work full-time for them. And I, I said, no, 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 and finally gave in. Uh, I love what I'm doing. Basically, I was worn down to the point where I couldn't say no anymore. <laughs> I'm working in the digital marketing services, uh, which is kind of an interesting place to be. Digital marketing services for a consumer product uh, company. So we have manufacturing to retail. In digital marketing, as you can imagine, we're concerned with consumer engagement. Over time, most consumer product companies move from sort of wholesale or distribution engagement to retail engagement and then eventually to consumer one-to-one -one engagement. And we're in that phase where we're trying to use digital means to get closer to the consumers and give them a, a more personalized experience. Of course, there's massive amounts of data that get collected, need to be analyzed, and used to create and refine programs as you move forward. And I love it. I mean, I love what I do. Every day is a challenge. We're working with you know millions and millions of consumers in the space, and I have a very rich supplier ecosystem that I have to manage, which I find both fascinating and exciting because my company says we're not a technology company. We do a lot of it, but uh, we engage with a lot of suppliers to get it done. So my job as an architect is really defining the big picture strategy for how the pieces are going to connect and then keeping them all sort of between the ditches uh, as they deliver. It's fascinating how you work for a consumer products company and how data is affecting how they do their business processes. Can you give us a couple of examples of how important data is to that type of industry? There's event data that occurs that's very important uh, that can be used for actual marketing programs. So, for example, one of the big problems in any space is how do you drive people to your website or how do you drive them to your app to get them to depend on it for things on a daily or weekly basis. As an example, you might say if you open the application on your phone or you visit the website five times this month, we will add uh, loyalty points to your account. And uh, with those loyalty points, you can get free products or any number of things uh, in the program. You think about all the pieces that have to fall into place to make something like that work. You're looking for a streak of activity in a bounded period of time. The traditional model is to build tools into the application to measure those streaks. And we fundamentally believe that that's the wrong way to architect it. The goal here then is to build sort of a generic activity tracker that you can attach ad hoc functions to the back end and they can manage their own metadata and data for measuring streaks and giving rewards. So the pipeline is filling with activities all the time, and then you set up a pub-sub model where subscribers can be attached uh, and specify their interests, register their interest in specific activities, and they may come and go all the time. So on any given day, I might have 100 of these functions. We write them in uh, as Azure functions. The 100 of these functions might be running on any, any given day, managing their own stores. In fact, third-party subscribers with Java libraries external to our system can get access to those as well if they want. So in the supplier ecosystem, we're seeing that start to happen as well. This is now an extensible model by which someone can say, hey, I want to do streak processing for these types of events, and these are the rules that I want to put on it. And we'll say, hey, good, so register your, your activity type, give us a schema for it so we can do validation, 
add a rule to the table that requires this sort of post-processing, write a function that subscribes, use whatever store and cache mechanisms you want to you know, manage the activities and the, the rules of whatever that system is supposed to do. So these things come into existence. They may run for 30 or 45 days or even a day or two, and then they get torn down. And it, it gives you this ability to, to build sort of a rich, uh, dynamic ecosystem of marketing processors that don't require you to hard code anything, right? Because you have, you have a bus, a series of buses, uh, where you can attach your interest in specific message types and then do with them what you want. That's very interesting. Where do you see this going in the future? Well, I think this sort of ad hoc application assembly is, people sometimes call it microservices, really is if, if we can get the management of the functions under control from a application lifecycle management perspective, that's really the future. And I think the onus is on Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure to get their products in these spaces in alignment with where people want to see these things go for building these kinds of systems. Today, it's a, it's a little bit choppy. You're in a space where there's just not a, enough tooling to support the richness and dynamism of these kinds of ecosystems. But I can imagine in the future, from user story to inception and development, design, testing, deployment, and management and production, and even defining as part of the lifecycle, hey, this function needs to sort of automatically publish itself for this period and then unpublish itself on a certain schedule, that needs to be better defined by the cloud providers. AWS has a little bit more maturity in this space than Microsoft does. Uh, Microsoft is catching up fast. Just like you can't count JavaScript out, you can't count Google out either. So when we see the maturity for the sort of the entire application lifecycle management around microservices get to the point where anybody can do it and doesn't require large enterprise players to do it, it will have changed the face of Arrakis, to use a Dune quote. What are your thoughts in regards to Walmart's policy of telling vendors that they really ought to get off of AWS? And has that affected you and your organization yet? And if not, is this something that you're keeping a close eye on? Yeah, it's it's really been a big topic of conversation here at my company and the you know, just my circle of developer friends. It really sent shockwaves through the, the whole ecosystem when they said that. I was in the Atlanta airport yesterday on the way back home, and you can't buy a Pepsi product in the Atlanta airport for obvious reasons. Right. But does that really make sense from a consumer perspective? Coca-Cola has their hometown there in Atlanta. I, I get it. But it, it doesn't mean that every traveler you know, that moves through the Atlanta airport can't buy a competing product or shouldn't be able to. And there, it's, it's a direct marketing play. Here, it's Walmart and Amazon. It's war because, you know, Amazon is just eating retailer lunches, so to speak. But it did send sort of shockwaves through the, the whole ecosystem when they made that announcement. And I, I think that ultimately, Walmart will pay the price for that. I think they're going to have to back off of that policy at some point. Right. And you have to wonder what would happen if Amazon decided to implement a be on our cloud or don't work with us policy. It could get messy. You can't say that um, Amazon is taking the high road on this because they appear to be more sort of egalitarian or maybe they have some indifference because they just believe they have superior product or at least they're leaders in the space, so they're showing a bit of hubris. It would be good for all of the players in the space to focus on the excellence of their products first then not try to dictate policy based on other business or supplier relationships. I get it. I understand why Walmart said and did what they did, but it's just really kind of unfortunate in my opinion. Yeah, and you have to wonder, could the regulatory hammer come down on this, and what are the unintended consequences of that? We can't even uh, get solid FCC policy related to neutrality out of the marketplace for consumers, much less they're venturing into the commercial space and trying to, to give us rules. So right. good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds messy and dirty. <laughs> yes. Would you say that you found your way to data or data found you? It hunted me down and almost killed me. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up as a software developer who obviously was, well, I guess, you know, we are um, 
if you believe in Gestalt psychology more, more than the Jungians, you're larger than the sum of your parts. It is true that my composition as a professional human being started and was largely pure software development for the first 15 years of my career, and databases were just a thing that I used. I'm sure I made a lot of DBAs really upset for those first 15 years. But in any case, I was forced to solve a problem one day many years ago that uh, really required someone that thought like a database person, and I was not thinking that way. I built a solution that was really, really really wrong and learned some valuable lessons from that process. So when I got through it and thought about it hard, I said, you know, I really need to sort of embark on a journey to learn about data and how to really use it correctly. At that time, it was really, I need to learn how to express my intent in these languages like Transact SQL or PLSQL. But it really evolved into more what I'd call category theory. How do I think about a problem categorically so when I get asked to solve a specific problem, how do I build the categorical solution for it? And writing good SQL code, for example, or building a good structure in Redis cache is really about making that leap from sort of instance thinking to categorical thinking. And that's when you become a data person, right? If you, when you make that leap, you're a data person. It's really kind of similar to the leap that people make from object-oriented thinking to functional thinking and programming. Right where I can say, you know, I want to do something, so I build a function for it. And does the function need to do everything, or can it do portions of it and then defer to another function? And can I pass one function to another as a parameter? Those kinds of things. So higher order functions, lazy evaluation, really have an analog to set-based logic that you do uh, your work in in the database world or category theory. And uh, I, I really see them as being the same thing, uh, just depending on your perspective. And so I made the functional leap and I made the data leap separately and then sort of tied it back together. But I will say that data, data hunted me down and turned me into a data person. <laughs> What's your favorite part of your current gig? It sounds like you, you might have to pick more than one. Yeah, I mean, I've, I would say there's lots of favorite parts Honestly, the favorite part is not a technical thing. It's in the digital marketing space. I work with some really, really cool marketing people that um, are not technical. And so I, I get to pick their brain about how they think about consumer experience and then help them with the transition to you know, building something that, that does what they're thinking about. So um, my favorite part of the day is almost always sitting down with someone who's not technical and talking through their evaluation of a trend that they're seeing, typically out of some information I've already given them, but they use their non-technical mind to evaluate it and then come back with ideas that I translate back into other technical solutions. And that's, that's probably my favorite thing every day. Very cool. Complete this sentence. When I'm not working, I enjoy blank. Sharpening chainsaws. <laughs> It's really weird. You know, you know, you don't know the things in life that are going to make you the happiest. Yeah. Um, I, I have some property, and I work on my property all the time, uh, cutting trails and maintaining trails and just trying to, you know, be a good steward of, of what I've been given. I have the occasion to sharpen my chainsaws and do maintenance on them almost every weekend. I have found that for whatever reason, I walk away from that experience in a zen-like state. It's just so calming. Uh, I get through the process. I hang the chainsaws back up in the shed. They're sharpened. They're oiled. They're gassed up. They're tuned. And I feel good about where they're at. And the process of getting them there just brings me uh, indescribable joy. I just don't know how to put it any other way. <laughs> well, you know, I've got a chainsaw that could really use some maintenance. And, I, you know, I'm willing to, uh, to send it to you. I would love to share what I know. <laughs> and rather than sending it to me uh, I will extend the offer that you can bring it to me and I will teach you the fish well and we live not far apart we live about a, what an hour hour and a half apart yes so I, I could do that I could see me doing that and I, I may take you up on that bring your swim trunks we'll sharpen chainsaws and get in the pool 
that's that's an offer i tell you uh, we have another complete this sentence i think the coolest thing in technology today is blank uh, I would say just the composability of applications. You know, when you think back to how things were just, you know, five or ten years ago, the idea of building an application that had this asynchronous capability, like you could say, I want to build an asynchronous messaging layer between this component and that component. Or I want to build um, a cache that has database semantics on it so I can I can write and read objects out of it, but I can put a time to live on a row in a database. That's a huge change to be able to say, I mean, think about that in terms of SQL Server. What if I could write a row into SQL Server and say, this row should disappear in five minutes? You can do that today. I mean, the caches like Cosmos DB and, uh, and Redis cache and you know things of that nature, th those are just things that are easy to assemble today. So now, you know, as an architect, I can open up this bag of tools and I just see this incredible rich set of tools that I can use to compose applications. It's the coolest thing that's happened, really, in my whole career. Uh, and it's happened in just in the last few years, so I love it. It makes my job a lot more fun than it used to be. Interesting. We have another complete the sentence. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to pretend that I'm not using technology. <laughs> this is, again, going back to the human angle. Like the fa My favorite part of the job is interacting with human beings to understand their worldview, their, their analysis, uh, have a conversation with them about what they're trying to accomplish. And I think when we get to the point, I was actually thinking about this yesterday in the, in the airport in Atlanta, walking through and there's, you know, how it is there, maybe if you've been through that, you know, it's just jam-packed, thousands of people within sight of any place that you are. Everybody's looking down at their phone, right, which is a fairly recent phenomenon. I mean, you can go back 10 years and that wasn't the case. Everybody is engaged in these screens and craning their necks to uh, try to keep connected to social media networks or, you know, friends and family or things at work. I really feel like it's a bubble, though, and I, and I hope it is that one day we can look forward to not doing that so that our interaction with people through social media and work and, and in every other venue that we build technical solutions in just becomes conversational. I'd love to not have a screen. Right, so going beyond the HoloLens, so to speak. There's an episode, um, a Black Mirror episode or two, <laughs> that touch on the dark side of this. I just want to be in conversation with my technology and have it be people focused. I see that a time when that's going to happen and we hear about AI and, you know, bots and things working in our environment, but I think it can be beautiful and I think it can be much more human than it is today. And I hope that happens. So I look forward to that. So Kevin, we do have that family friendly ranking on iTunes. And we want to keep that. I say that as a disclaimer to this next question. Share something different about yourself. I was teaching college classes for about 12 years and uh, got really fed up with school that my kids were in, the school system, and decided to run for the school board. And I got elected twice now and to serve on my, my local county school board for my district and have served as the chairman of the Maggie L. Walker Governor School school board in Richmond, served on lots of other public service committees related to that. It's been a really wonderful opportunity to learn and grow. I can tell you that there's a book, another book that I'll recommend is called The Alchemist, Paolo Coelho. It's a book about defining really what beginner's luck is all about. And really when it comes down to it, the spoiler is that beginner's luck is not being encumbered by the things you don't know. And serving on the school board has really fit that model in that when I ran for the school board, I thought I knew a lot more than I did. Uh, learned very quickly after having served for a while that I didn't know much at all. But through the unencumbrances that I had for what I didn't know, um, I was able to get things done uh, that I wouldn't have otherwise tried. So, you know, this... Um, I do believe in term limits. Um, I'm imposing that on myself. So when I'm done in 2019 with my second four-year term, I will step away from it, mainly because I've gotten to the point where 
I probably know a little too much at this point. We want to strike a balance, obviously, in our society where we have people that want to step up and serve, but at some point you have served long enough and other people should have the opportunity. So I'm going to give someone else that opportunity in my district. I do love it, and I love supporting uh, public education in, you know, in my area and across the state of Virginia. So a little different. Interesting. I was very curious to, to see uh, what you were going to share, because you, you've lived a very interesting and varied and unique life like, that I've seen, and I'm sure I only know a little bit of it. So I was just curious of what you would pick, you know. And I think you might be the first elected official on the podcast. <laughs> I'd like to see more of us. In fact, you can see with the headlines these days, we need more people who understand technology serving, you know, being public servants, especially legislators. I hope, you know, what I've done maybe hopefully serves to inspire someone else to step up and run for public office in their district or their state or whatever level. If you're a technologist, we sorely need you to serve because the Congress we have today God bless them, but they uh, they have a difficult time understanding how some of this stuff works. Uh, and this I have firsthand knowledge of. My last role at Microsoft was technology evangelist to basically Capitol Hill. And it doesn't matter what party. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you are technically savvy, your country needs you. Indeed. So uh, where can people find out more about what you've been up to? And where can people find out find you and ask you questions or, or whatever? Well, I show up at conferences like Build and Microsoft conferences. I, I've also gone to the AWS reInvent conference fairly regularly. Uh, I like to keep one leg in each camp. If we get to, uh, if Google really becomes a strong player in the cloud space, I don't know what I'm going to do because I'll have three major conferences to attend every year. And I like to connect with people there. I typically go to a handful of sessions when I'm at those conferences, but I'm mostly there to connect with people. I'm also um, leading the .NET user group in Richmond, Virginia, which is kind of a misnomer these days because .NET runs on everything. We have as many talks about Xamarin run, you know, running .NET code on iOS and, and Android and talks about different cloud technologies as we do about the .NET framework. Uh, in fact, I'd say in the course of a year, if we had 12 presentations, maybe one or two would really be like hardcore .NET topics. Run that group, and you can certainly uh, visit us if you're in the region. If you're a speaker in the Mid-Atlantic region in particular and you want to get on the, the schedule there, I would invite you to contact me. Uh, I can be found on Twitter at uh, Kevin Hazard, uh, two Zs, uh, like Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> That's about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin, for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with us today and chat with us. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen, become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv. Today's episode of Data Driven was brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at thedatadrivenbook.com. And this is the point in the show where we thank our sponsors who make Data Driven possible. You know, on Data Driven, we talk a lot about data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But did you know the hardest part of any data science related project is data integration? Data scientists often call data integration, data wrangling, or the icky word munging. But it's all about making sure the analytics engine that you're using has valid and clean data. Enterprise Data and Analytics specializes in data integration and can help your enterprise build better data integration solutions faster with best practices and automation. Enterprise Data and Analytics offers training and consulting services for SQL Server Integration Services, SSIS, and Business Intelligence Markup Language, or BIML. Visit entdna.com to learn more. Enterprise Data and Analytics. Data. It's in their DNA.